Hello and welcome to Impact Exchange. My name is Professor Richard Hall. I'm Deputy Dean at Monash Business School. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Professor Tony Venables, who is Professor of Economics at Oxford University. I'd love today to talk about a number of issues. I uh, might start out with talking a little bit about you and your own personal journey. Uh, you're obviously a very distinguished academic and a very distinguished academic career, but also a great career in terms of public policy and influence and practice as well. But it all started out, didn't it, for you with an interest, I guess, in international trade. And you started researching and making a name for yourself in that field. But then you changed and expanded into a broader range of interests. Can you tell us something about those early days in working in international trade and what caused you to move on to a broader range of interests? Well, as a graduate student, I was actually working on development economics. Um, but one problem I started thinking about was in, well, it obviously had, it was obviously an international trade issue, an international trade problem. Mm. And I guess I had this sort of good fortune of never actually having taken an international trade course. Mm. So I just started from scratch and did what seemed to me to be the sensible way to address this problem. Um, and it sort of worked, and that was nice. So it was from, from that um, that took me, well, launched me down that path of, of international trade. And I must say that there were some in inspiring people around when I was a graduate student as well who you know, helped, helped me with that in, in the trade field, but also in other fields. Tell us a little bit about some of those inspirational influences that caused you to take a broader view than just merely a, a strict economics view of international trade. Well, there were two really big figures in, in Oxford at that time. And I was lucky enough to know both of them pretty well and be supervised with them. So two people who got Nobel Prizes in later life. I mean, one was James Murleys, who was very much the mathematical economist, uh, rather straight-laced Scottish Presbyterian, but <laughs> uh, a very impressive man. And the other was Joe Stiglitz, who many people would have seen on television uh, hold, holding forth on things. Yeah. But in those days, he was, well, he was low 30s, full professor at Oxford, absolutely charismatic figure for, for graduate students like, like, like me. I'd like if I could to uh, draw your attention to, to cities. Mm. Um, obviously you've been in, in Australia talking about the economics of cities and they continue to be a, a topic of, of, of ongoing fascination and conversation. Urbanisation is of course one yeah. of the great mega trends of our time and has been um, pivotally involved in, in, in the political economy of both advanced and developing uh, uh, countries. Um, perhaps to reflect for a moment on a simple, well, perhaps a complex question, the idea of a city. I mean, what, what is the idea of a city? Hmm. Yes, um, cities exist, right? Standard, yeah, rather standard textbook economics. Cities wouldn't exist. Right. I mean, people have done a bit of, you know, Basic economics will have done diminishing returns to this, that, and the next, in which case activity is going to be spread out. So yes. you need you know, a, a radical new way of thinking about the basic economics to understand cities. And to me, I'm going to try and answer your question, uh, to me it's, yes, yeah, cities are where people are more productive. Wow. And that's, that's the fundamental driver. Uh, we've got lots of empirical evidence on that. You know, productivity in London is 60% higher than in the rest of the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, and lots of statistical evidence that this is pretty robust. So cities are productive. And another dimension to cities, it seems as though many of the classic studies, I guess, have focused on you know, what it is that makes an individual city work and be distinctive. And as you say about productivity and population growth, it has a capacity to attract people, obviously, mm. the urbanisation trend, but they, they, they choose and they follow, I assume you would say, they're following work opportunities by yeah. and large. Uh, and different cities seem to have a reputation. We think about London, we think about its financial services in particular, and the yeah. role of the city there yeah. that, that, that makes the place work. Yeah. And what is it that determines uh, the, the success or failure of, of those cities in terms of what they specialise on? Should they be specialising in particular things or should they be generalist kind of cities? I mean, thinking about connectivity, I mean, it, yeah, but what, what does it take to, to deliver a connected city? Right? I, th I think that's... And sort of underlying, underlying your question there. Mm. Um, and you can do it a couple of ways, I guess. I mean, one is building it dense. 
so right. that people are physically you know, close together. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, or both these things, the other is putting in the, the, the transport infrastructure, the, 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 the connectivity you know, physically through uh, public transport, whatever, so mm -hmm. that people, mm -hmm. I mean, in yeah, London there are 150,000 people per square kilometre mm -hmm. working in the city mm -hmm. of London. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, some live close, many, but anyway, so, so achieving that, connect, that density and connectivity. Well, I'd, I'd like to, and talk about achieving it, obviously in Australian cities in particular and uh, US cities, perhaps less so European cities, dealing with issues around urban sprawl and yeah. the economic and yeah. physical challenges of, 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 of servicing you know, dispersed populations in pretty yeah. big cities is a yeah. major issue. I mean, what are the kinds of things that you think cities should be focusing on or not focusing on? You know, do we try and plan or do we try and let the market do other things? Do we focus on transport or do we focus on trying to have high density building regulations to attract people back into the center? Do you have any views on that? The, the, the issue of yeah, planning, uh, I think it is essential for cities. Um, yeah, the market can do most things, but if you're thinking about you know, a, a, a sub-center for the city, mm -hmm. where's it going to be? Mm -hmm. It could be there, 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 anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if investors don't know, mm -hmm. they're not going to build. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. somehow there has to be a way of you know, communicating, signaling mm -hmm. um, yeah, that this is the place we're going to develop. Mm -hmm. um, that might be a city plan. Mm -hmm. um, Although city plans aren't, often aren't very credible. Again, I can't speak for Australian ones, but you know, experience <laughs> in Africa, there are a lot of city plans, very few of which have actually been, been, been followed through mm. uh, in practice. Mm. But anyway, the, the point is, yeah, you, you somehow have to, have to signal either through a credible city plan or by putting infrastructure in. So yeah. this is the commitment, right? We've put mm. the infrastructure in that place. We've done the rail link to that place. Therefore, it's going to be that place that develops. Uh, not somewhere else. Mm, mm, mm. And what about paying for all this? Because of mm. course the issue around infrastructure expenditure, I mean we're seeing massive commitments in, in Australia at this particular time to catch up with so-called infrastructure underspending over a number of decades. But um, these, these are major commitments yeah. at a time when governments are struggling with resources and there's a whole bunch of other issues and yeah. things to be spending um, uh, scarce resources on. So do you have any thoughts as an economist about the, the most effective, efficient and fair ways in which we can, we, we, we can fund better infrastructure and transport networks in cities? Well, there's a very good uh, economics answer to that question, which is um, taxing urban land. Right. Um, yeah, cities are productive. Who really benefits from that productivity? Are you better off in the city than outside? Maybe, maybe not. But the people who really benefit are the people who happen to own land in the city centre. And they're taking these you know, huge capital gains, mm -hmm. um, not because of what they've done, but because the city's successful in delivering this, this productivity impact. Mm -hmm. So very strong argument for having a land tax of some sort. Mm -hmm. And yeah, most cities obviously do have some sort of land or property taxation. Mm -hmm. um, but really doing that, I think, is important. Uh, certainly our work in developing countries, uh, trying, to, trying to get countries uh, to do that, mm. um, I, I think is very important. They, they often find it difficult because they don't have a proper land registry actually saying who owns what. Yes. But you want to put in the land registry for all sorts of reasons to allow tradability of property and things. But also, uh, so that, that, that tax base is something cities should, in my view, um, use. Provided you have security of tenure, obviously, and, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. as you say, yeah, registration right. you, you, of land ownership. You, you have to have a, that, that basic structure of yeah. you know, proper registration so yeah. you know who owns what. Okay, um, yeah. so land tax, I mean, there's a good yeah. argument for that. Then, then another topical one, I guess, is when we talk about transport in particular, you know, uh, tolls of various kinds for mm. usage. What, what, what's, what's your line on the, the wisdom of, of, of that strategy? Yeah, road space is inherently limited and most cities have a congestion problem of some sort. So how do you ration the use of crowded roads? Mm, mm, well, mm. there are two ways. One is by making people you know, sit, sit in their car, sit in bur burning petrol, wasting time. That's the, that's the deterrent, that's, that's the rationing device. Uh, and that's burning real resources, you know, my time mm -hmm. and gasoline and, and, and things. Mm. Um, 
the other is by asking them to hand some money over to the government mm, uh, mm. through uh, uh, the congestion tax. Mm, mm. Um, the congestion tax is the more efficient way of doing it, for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And and we also see um, those congestion charges applying for entering the city. We're going to see more of that. Do you think? I mean, yeah. even in the age of aut autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, and so forth, we're seeing to see a major revolution in transport. Sort of forms yeah. in the way in which we yeah. we use those, but do you see those trends continuing to, to to tax people for who want to indulge in going into the city? Well, you're, it's a congestion charge, right? You're not taxing people for going to the city. You're saying there's a problem on this stretch of road mm. that it's causing. Mm. Yeah, mm. if it's not being charged for properly, then it's causing mm. you know, tailbacks and people to waste their time. Mm. So these are these are. Yeah, a congestion tax, a road tax of that sort is, is a targeted policy trying to achieve something in, in specific. And I think it's very important to keep that, that distinction in mind, mm. uh, particularly if you're going to try and sell it politically, just <laughs> saying here's a tax for going into the city. No, no, no that, that's okay. not what it is. Right. It's, a, it's a congestion charge. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and another topical question at the moment is, is of course, public transport and, and some places at least toying with or I think uh, that Luxembourg was actually going to introduce a completely free public transport. Mm. Um, it's a public good, you could argue, in many ways, that it is something that, that simply the, the transaction costs involved in, yeah. in collecting revenue from public transport. Uh, do you have views about the virtues of, of, of completely free public transport? Well, yeah, pu urban public transport gets some sort of subsidy al almost everywhere, mm. which is great. Mm. Um, no, I don't think it should be completely free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if it were, it would get congested and would say, let's bring in a congestion <laughs> charge for public transport. So I mean, you know, paying some price, I think, is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that can be done. You know, I mean, integrated ticketing, all this stuff, which obviously works in major cities su such as Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cards and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, so the opportunities yeah. for technology to improve the efficiencies of these systems is really significant. Yeah, you know, you see you, it's easy to get on and off. It's, it's easy to use. You're paying a little bit per journey. Fine. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Tony, it's been wonderful chatting with you and thank you so much for your visit to Monash Business School and to Australia. Well, it's been a great visit uh, so far and I'm sure it will remain so. So thank you. Thanks, Tony.